Okay, now let's put aside these five blue zones and examine the concept that vegan or vegetarian diets are associated with decreased morbidity, decreased mortality, or longevity in literature. And this type of literature is not something that we have a lot of interventional literature on, unfortunately, because when you are studying something like longevity or overall mortality, you essentially must do epidemiology, which is uh, essentially synonymous with observational research. So this is the caveat that I will try to always make when I am discussing epidemiology, AKA observational research, that this is observational research. And the problem with this type of research, I get questions about this all the time in my direct messages, my DMs on Instagram, et cetera, is that it has so much potential to be confounded by two things called healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. And if you've listened to any of my content, those terms probably ring some bells in your memory because you've heard me say them so many times. And I continue to find it incredibly important, indispensable to clarify these terms for people and to get the idea out there to help express, to help communicate to the public that these things confound epidemiology observational research because how often do we see on the news another headline, eggs, bacon, et cetera, walking down the street is associated with a bad effect. And I get, I got a DM the other day. Somebody said, how do you respond to the association between red meat and cancer? And I'll do another aside in a moment and talk about how I responded that the, to that DM. But the first thing I said in response to that direct message was, do you understand that correlation is not causation, that observational studies are valuable for generating a hypothesis, which must then be tested by an interventional study, but cannot be used to draw causative inference? It is impossible. It is really just incorrect to do that is a folly and it will lead us down a path of ruin and deception. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at epidemiology and we're gonna take all of those caveats into this and say, none of this is causative. This is just correlation from which we can draw a hypothesis. And these are usually surveys. People are asked, what do you eat? And then they are asked, how healthy are you? And we can look prospectively or we can look retrospectively. A lot of these are prospective studies to see how long people live and what their mortality is. And we can look for evidence that a vegan or vegetarian diet may be associated with less mortality. Now, there are many studies, which I will point out here. If you're watching on YouTube, I will do screen shares. If you're listening to this podcast, then I will read the titles of these studies for you set so that you can go and look them up if you so desire. I try to always put as much actual solid science into these podcasts as I can so that you guys can uh, substantiate what I'm saying. And if you ever need more uh, in this sense, you can go to either Radical Health at heartandsoil.co, give the team over there an email. The folks there will send you refer research, um, or you can send me a DM on Instagram, and I'm trying to get to all of those these days. So let's start with a couple of epidemiology studies and really start to examine this notion. Does a vegetarian diet always associate with more uh, longevity, or are there issues with this statement, which would be something that vegans and vegetarians are pretty proud of, but there's a couple of holes in this argument too. So let's start with this one. The title is Vegetarian Diet and All-Cause Mortality, Evidence from a Large Population-Based Australian Cohort, the 45 and Up Study. If you just read the conclusions, they say, um, we found no evidence that following a vegetarian diet semi-vegetarian diet, and I think they are referring to a lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet, and a vegetarian diet in this paper refers to a vegan diet, or a pesco-vegetarian diet, has an independent protective effect on all-cause mortality. And this was a large study. This was 243,900, uh, excuse me, 243,096 participants, mean age 62.3 years, they were 46.7% men, and they were followed um, they were all over 45 years old, and they were followed for a number of years uh, in the study, and they found no protective effect of a vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, again, which is probably lacto-ovo, or uh, a pesco-vegetarian diet. Now, I just want to comment on something about a pesco-vegetarian diet real quickly. I tweeted this recently. If you don't follow me on Twitter, you may want to do so there. Um, I said, a pesco-vegetarian diet is a great way to get heavy metal toxicity. <laughs> there are so many examples now of people that I've known, famous people in the media, including uh, Tony Robbins, including um, 
well, what's the guy's name on Sirius XM? I'll think of it, Howard Stern, uh, who had frank heavy metal toxicity from a pesco vegetarian diet. So if you are including a lot of fish in your diet, be careful. Check your heavy metals, check your lead, check your arsenic, check your cadmium, check your mercury. You can check blood levels of these things. It's super easy. Uh, you don't need to do a provoked test, although they are stored in bones and a provoked test may be a more accurate measure or it may give you another data point. You can just get a blood level of lead, cadmium, arsenic, mercury, and uh, get a sense of how heavy metal toxic you are. Now the blood levels will be more acute a provoked test with DMSA, DMSO, or EDTA may be a little more long-term in terms of your stores of these heavy metals. But I've seen this in my clients repeatedly, even if they have a binge. I had a client once who had OPA, which is a type of fish from the grocery store. And he said, oh, this OPA was on sale. And get lo and behold, he'd been eating a lot of OPA that week. His heavy metals were off the charts in simply a week from this acute exposure. I've seen it in clients who were eating wild salmon three to four times a week. They had elevated levels of mercury. These are not good things, guys. So this is another corollary question that I get sometimes. What about fish on an animal-based diet? My answer is, theoretically, fish is great. I don't think you need the omega-3 fatty acids from fish. I addressed that last week in the Ask Me Anything podcast where I talked about the importance and the availability of getting omega-3 fatty acids from ruminant animal fat. But fish are also quite contaminated with heavy metals. Be aware of this. Even if you're eating wild salmon, it has significantly more mercury than you're going to get in beef or chicken or lamb or turkey. And this is going to accumulate in your body. If you're doing things like tuna, buyer beware. That's a big problem. Mahi-mahi, grouper, even those fish have moderate to high levels of heavy metals and the benthic fish too. The shellfish, the mussels, the scallops, the clams, the lobsters, the crabs, a lot of these things sink to the bottom and accumulate in those fish. So this is not a good recipe for long-term success. Once a week, sure. A couple times a month, no problem. More than that, I think you're eating some of the more dirty animal foods on the planet. Just be aware and check your heavy metals. I live in Costa Rica now. I surf a lot. I've thought about getting into free diving. I'm horrible at holding my breath, but I want to get better at it. And one of the, I think, disincentives for me to get into free diving is that free diving is often connected with spearfishing, which sounds super fun and interesting, except I'm not going to eat anything I catch for the most part, maybe a small fish here and there, but most of what I catch, I'm going to feel so guilty about the heavy metals from that. And like I said before, I don't think there's a whole lot unique in fish that you want to get in your diet that you can't just get from ruminant animal meat and organs, lamb, beef, bison, these type of things. Now, Theoretically, historically, is this always been an issue? Probably not. I think we're polluting the ocean. This is part of our life cycle on the planet as humans. Um, not necessarily intrinsically part of our life cycle, just part of our life cycle. Uh, historically, we've, we've done this to the oceans. And so things are changing. I often say to people, would you eat a cow from Tokyo that's grown in the middle of Tokyo? It's inhaling that horrible air or a cow that's grown in the middle of Beijing. Or do you want a cow from rural Georgia, like White Oak Pastures, or from perhaps rural Costa Rica, right up the street from my house, there's cows grazing on the land here on the Guanacaste Peninsula. I would rather eat the cow that's in cleaner air. But what if all of the fish you eat is equivalent to the cow in Tokyo or the cow in Beijing, because it's all kind of swimming in dirty water. And the longer the fish lives, the more it's going to accumulate these heavy metals. This is a problem with excess fish in the diet. And again, I don't think you need fish for omega-3s. You can get plenty from ruminant animal fat, especially exactly because you are avoiding seed oils, because you are avoiding omega-3, excuse me, omega-6s, which share the same synthesis pathway to the end result, those longer chain omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, as I talked about last week on the podcast. So pescatarians, lacto-ovo-vegetarians, vegetarians, no improvement in mortality in this very large study in Australia in adults, about half of whom were men, slightly more than half were women, who were above 45 years old. Let's look at another one. This is a study that I've talked about a lot. It's a really important study. It's called Mortality in British, British Vegetarians. Sometimes I refer to it as the UK shopper study. What's so interesting about this study is that um, they looked at a couple of different things. They looked at standardized mortality ratios and they compared vegans, well, they lumped in vegetarians and vegans together with omnivores. And then they looked at death rate ratios and they compared these for vegetarians and non-vegetarians with non-vegetarians being omnivores. And what they found were that when you looked at the standard mortality ratios for all causes in death, they were significantly below the reference level of 100 in both studies, 52 uh, based on 1,131 uh, deaths in the Oxford vegetarian study and 59 based on 2,000 
the 346 deaths in the health food shopper study for all causes of death, the DRR, the death rate ratios for vegetarians compared with non-vegetarians was close to one in both studies. So what they found here essentially was that British vegetarians have a low mortality compared to the general population. Their death rates are similar to those of comparable non-vegetarians, meaning in terms of health behaviors, suggesting that much of this benefit may be attributed to non-dietary lifestyle factors, such as a low prevalence of smoking and a generally high socioeconomic status or to aspects of the diet other than the avoidance of meat and fish. This is actually a really good illustration of what you might consider to be healthy user bias. And so when you account for this and you compare British vegetarians to British omnivores who have healthy behaviors, who are higher socioeconomic status, who have a low prevalence of smoking, then you see similar rates of death and mortality. But what happens in our population in the West is that we have been told for 70 plus years that meat is bad for us. And so who eats meat? The people that ride motorcycles, the people that smoke, the people who are generally of lower socioeconomic status because they're more rebellious. They don't always correlate, but we know this does happen. These are risk-taking humans and they are willing to risk take their way into a hamburger. And the part of that hamburger that's probably the worst for them is the special sauce with the seed oils and perhaps even the tomatoes on there, which has lectins, which could be contributing to GI distress or leaky gut. And certainly that bun, which is full of gluten and other lectins and probably has some processed sugar along with the milkshake, which has a ton of sugar, the fries cooked in seed oils and the uh, Coke on the side, perhaps, which is going to have a ton of processed sugar as well. So what we gain from this is these two very different classes of people. We have the unhealthy user bias people, the super rebellious people who are much more likely to eat meat over the last 70 years, and the healthy user bias people, the goody two shoes, beaver cleaver types who are much less likely to eat meat over the last 70 years because that's what we've been told that it's bad for you. And we know that the healthy user bias people, the beaver cleaver types are more likely to do healthy behaviors. They're more likely to play tennis on Sunday. They're more likely to be of higher socioeconomic status. They're more likely to not smoke. They're more likely to get colonoscopies or mammograms. They're more likely to get sunlight because they're outside and they're living in places where they can be outside. They're more likely to live in areas that are suburban rather than urban and have better air quality, which we know is connected with all of this. And the unhealthy user bias participants are likely to do all of those things on the negative side of that spectrum. So this is the problem with epidemiology. Those health behaviors may correlate with uh, food choices around meat that do not actually affect their health in the same way as the bad behaviors, which is why this study is so striking. The fact that vegetarians and non-vegetarians in Britain have the same mortality when they have similar ways of life, when they have similar lifestyles, when they have similar uh, low prevalence of smoking, higher socioeconomic status, healthy behaviors. This is what healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias are all about and why epidemiology studies are so damn misleading. So the next time you see these things on the news, what you will find over and over and over is that with meat, you're always going to have this healthy user bias on one side with the vegetarians and the unhealthy user bias on the other side with the meat eaters. So these, you see results on both sides of the fence. And it's very interesting to know and important to know that there are many epidemiology studies that don't show any correlation between eating meat and poor outcomes. And when they do, it's probably because they're sampling a population in which you're seeing more of this unhealthy user bias. And there are lots of studies that don't show any benefit to vegan or vegetarian diets for mortality. And sometimes they do, perhaps because they are sampling a population which, with more of this healthy user bias present in the population.